So a few different people have asked me to make a video about John Bergman and I've decided to watch one of the half hour to health talks he's uploaded to his channel. Now the subject of his talk is HIV and AIDS and Bergman does his best to prove that the disease doesn't really exist, the tests don't work and the medicines aren't effective. Before we get started, I think it's worth briefly defining a couple of terms. HIV is an acronym for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. It's a retrovirus that attacks immune cells and left untreated over a period of time, HIV destroys the immune system. And this allows diseases and some cancers to develop that would otherwise be controlled by the immune system in a healthy person. And this is what we get the AIDS acronym. It stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. Now, not all people who are infected with HIV are going to develop AIDS. They're just HIV positive, and because AIDS is the end result of an HIV infection, it might be crudely referred to as full-blown AIDS. One more point worth making is that AIDS was identified as a syndrome before the virus was discovered as the cause. So early on, people would often refer to AIDS itself as being contagious, and that kind of language isn't all that helpful now, given that we know that the infectious cause is HIV. Now, this is all important because Bergman repeatedly confuses HIV and AIDS throughout his talk, and by raking over the content of literature that was written before and just after the discovery of HIV, he's managed to confuse himself and his audience. Now, there are a lot of mistakes in his half hour to health talk, so let's just look at some of the more boneheaded blunders, and if this video proves popular, I'll eventually release a video covering the whole thing. Now, a big part of Bergman's talk is based on quoting people and then Bergman waffling about what he thinks the implications are, but most of these quotes are obscure, out of context, or just fabricated. Let's take a few examples. In Japan, AIDS is virtually unknown. Okay, it's almost not in the population at all, um, except incredibly small. You're talking hundreds of a percent of the population. 25% of the people are found to be HIV positive. So is the HIV test accurate or inaccurate? I'm going to actually tell you the facts on this. Okay. So what's Bergman saying here? Well, apparently a quarter of the population of Japan is testing positive for the HIV virus, even though almost no one in Japan develops AIDS. The implication, of course, is that either the test is worthless or the virus doesn't really cause AIDS. So where did this statistic come from? Well, the earliest example of this claim I could find was a repost of this blog article to unsolvedmysteries.com. And I found an email for its author, a Dr. Pat Rattigan. I emailed Dr. Rattigan to ask for his source for this 25% claim. When he replied, I was disappointed to discover that he since demoted himself from a doctor of naturopathy to a diploma of naturopathy. He confirmed that he had written the text, but he didn't tell me where he got the 25% number from. He simply sent me a new version without the claim in it. And when I asked again, he ignored me. So neither Bergman nor the author of the claim are willing to provide the source, and it flies in the face of everything that is known about HIV testing. I think it's fair to conclude that this was just made up, or a misinterpretation of some other data long since forgotten. Let's take another quote from Bergman's talk. He uses this line, attributed to a British health advisor, Dr. Rachel Bagley, to undermine the claim of AIDS mortality in Zambia. Yeah. Now here, some of the quotes, and these, these are people that are actually in the field trying to treat AIDS. No one in Zambia ever dies of AIDS. They'll say it's malaria, fever, or TB. That's absolutely. Um, from the University of Chico. So Bergman is saying here that AIDS isn't really killing people, other diseases are responsible, and this quote proves it. I tracked down the 1995 article this quote came from, and it seemed pretty clear to me that it was taken out of context, and people were dying of AIDS, they just didn't want to admit it because of the fear around the disease at the time. But rather than take my interpretation, you can hear it straight from the horse's mouth, because I emailed Dr. Rachel Bagley, who's now at the World Health Organization, and asked her about this line in Bergman's talk. Here's her response. This is totally bizarre. Of course, this quote is from 1995. It would have been referring to the fact that because of the stigma, people would not say that their relative had died of AIDS. They would say something else, like he died of malaria, or a fever, or TB, or a long illness. I ran an HIV testing service in Lusaka at this time, and there was no antiretroviral therapy available. So there were lots of issues at this time around people not wanting to get tested. 25 years later, and we're at a completely different stage, of course. With effective therapies, testing is much more acceptable and people's lives have been transformed. Living in Lusaka during those sad times before treatment was heartbreaking. I lost so many dear friends and colleagues. 
Now, with antiretroviral therapy, HIV is manageable, of course, and my friends with HIV who managed to survive those dark days and are taking treatment continue to do so well, leading healthy lives. So someone is deliberately taking this out of context. It makes me cross to see me misquoted. In fact, as far back as 1994, the year before this quote, I wrote a paper about AIDS-related mortality in Zambian businesses, and I've worked on HIV and AIDS ever since. So it's completely ridiculous to use this comment, completely out of context, to support a denialist agenda. Now, pulling quotes like this is shamefully misleading, and it really reminds me of creationist-level quote mining. Look, whether or not you believe HIV or AIDS exists, I don't think anyone deserves to have their words twisted in such a ridiculous fashion by Bergman in pursuit of his nefarious objectives. Here's another poorly applied quote where Bergman again tries to undermine the link between HIV and AIDS. Well, let's look at some experts. Now, first off, here's the winner of Nobel Prize Chemistry. We have not been able to discover any good reason why most of the people on Earth believe that AIDS is caused by HIV. Hmm, Nobel Prize. Um, there, is a simp it's, there is simply no scientific evidence demonstrating that this is true. So Bergman seems to be suggesting here that because Kerry Mullis has a Nobel Prize, he's a smart guy and we should just believe what he says. He certainly doesn't give any other reason to trust what Mullis is saying. But there are a few problems with this. Firstly, there are lots of other Nobel Prize winners who disagree. Here's two good examples. Luc Montagna and Francois Barsinussi shared the 2008 Nobel Prize for their discovery of HIV as the viral cause of AIDS. I'm not sure how Bergman would propose we clear up this conflict. My suggestion would be, rather than hyping our favoured experts' credentials, we could look at the research they actually did on the subject they're talking about. In the case of Luc Montagna and Francois Barsinussi, that would be hundreds of scientific articles in the relevant field. For Kerry Mullis, that would be nothing. He's not a medical researcher, and his Nobel Prize wasn't in medicine, it was in chemistry. In his LA Times obituary, Kerry Mullis was described as an LSD-dropping, climate-change-denying, astrology-believing, board-surfing, Nobel Prize-winning chemist who was both widely respected and equally criticised for his controversial views. So yes, Kerry Mullis won the Nobel Prize, and was obviously a remarkably intelligent person, but unless Bergman is going to give us some compelling reason to believe him over other eminently more qualified, equally intelligent, and presumably less deranged scientists, we can dispense with this quote as well. Now, as I said earlier, Bergman repeatedly rakes over decades-old controversies in his efforts to confuse his audience. Here's a good example. They came up with a single definitive definition of what AIDS is in Africa. Okay, you ready? Okay. You have to have fever, diarrhea, weight loss, coughing, or itching. Okay, now, 60% of sub-Saharan Africa 60% of sub-Saharan Africa live in huts with dirt floors. And the dirt, it's either dirt floors or it's floors made with, with cow dung to keep the dirt down. Now, they have an average of seven kids. Okay, seven kids in that, in, in that one little one room. Okay, so we're talking an absolute horrible aspect of... Sa no, in unsafe drinking water, inadequate food, basic sanitation is gone, and this is just horrible. Do you, do you think a lot of people there are going to have itching, coughing, diarrhea, or weight loss? So what's Bergman doing here? Well, firstly, he's minimizing the symptoms that were required for this 1985 AIDS diagnosis. To be diagnosed with AIDS using the symptoms Bergman described, you would need to have weight loss of more than 10% of your body weight, repeated or continuous attacks of fever for more than a month, and diarrhea for more than a month. And you'd also need one more additional symptom, which could include coughing or skin irritation. A day of diarrhea is a very different prospect to an entire month. Now, Bergman also says that lack of adequate food could also cause these same symptoms, and he's not wrong, but if he'd actually read the case definition he's talking about, he would have known that malnutrition excluded you from being diagnosed of AIDS. It's literally the first point in this table. And he would have also known that the World Health Organization were very much aware of the limitations of this system, and in the very same document, emphasized that it could only be a provisional diagnosis, and that testing for HIV needed to be deployed in Africa. And for well over 20 years now, positive HIV test has been a requirement for an AIDS diagnosis globally. And now we've dealt with this confusion, I think the answer to Bergman's next question is going to be painfully obvious. Okay, now, now AIDS is diagnosed differently in Africa than it is in America. 
I'm sorry, is chicken pox different in China and different in America? Is tuberculosis different in Australia and then different in Alaska? No. Is there any disease on the planet that has different diagnoses or did anyone got a challenge with this? Uh, yes, I do have a challenge with this. Diseases are diagnosed with different criteria and tests all over the world due to differences in the resources and capabilities of different healthcare systems and also differences in the prevalence of diseases. Okay, so let's carry on with some more confusion about diagnosing AIDS. Now, 1992, okay, there were more diseases added indicating 29 diseases. So if you had any one of 29 diseases along with the lifestyle factors that predispose you to this, you got AIDS, okay? Now, now this was huge because it also, they had people without being sick that would have AIDS. And this was a low CD4 count. A CD4 is part of an immune system cell. If any, anybody in here want to just experiment around and mess around with the medical doctors to get a low CD4 count, what you got to do to lower your CD4 count, don't eat for eight days. And then if you happen to have lifestyle factors, you're going to have a positive AIDS test. So what's he on about here? Well, in the very early days, immediately after the first few cases of AIDS were identified in gay men in the USA, lifestyle factors were a necessary filter to identify who could have possibly caught what was at the time a potentially new infectious agent. And certain diseases like Kaposi's sarcoma and a certain type of pneumonia called PCP that were otherwise very rare were used to diagnose AIDS in this population. Fast forward just a few years later, and effective tests for the virus were developed. And lifestyle factors were used to identify at-risk groups, but not in the diagnosis or surveillance of HIV. They had the test. Now you could be HIV positive without yet having developed AIDS, but doctors still wanted to monitor how many HIV positive people were progressing to AIDS and how fast that was happening. So they still used the indicator diseases to diagnose AIDS, but only in people who had already tested positive for HIV. So in 1992, they expanded the list of diseases that placed an HIV-positive person into the AIDS category. Why would they do this? Well, I guess to better capture the mortality and morbidity caused by the virus. People needed to know what would likely happen to the newly identified HIV-positive population, which drugs would be needed and how much it might cost. The expansion simply recognized that HIV could allow a greater range of diseases to develop than previously thought. Uh, more recently, CD4 count is used to monitor the state of your immune system. The less CD4 cells you have, the further your disease has progressed. Using CD4 count to diagnose AIDS is a more objective method. It allows doctors to make easier comparisons between patients and therapies. But when Bergman says that you're going to have a positive AIDS test with a low CD4 count and the correct lifestyle factors, he's talking absolute rubbish. This has never been possible, and since the mid-1980s, it is essential to test positive for HIV to be diagnosed of AIDS. And if you went to the doctor after not eating for eight days, he'd send you home with a prescription for a pizza. And if you told him that you thought you might have AIDS, he'd test you for HIV and rule it out immediately. But please don't mess around with medical doctors. It's a waste of everyone's time, especially when Bergman's clever ruse is doomed to fail. And it seems pretty obvious to me that he's never tried this not eating for eight days trick on himself. It was first diagnosed back in um, 1958 at an experimental clinic um, inside of the Congo. That's where most of the AIDS cases first came from. And I can say that it was because the infections, or it was an experimental polio virus that was grown in infected monkey tissue and it was distributed around the Congo out of a French chemical warfare plant. And this is what developed this experimental vaccine. In Paris, in Paris, what they came up with is that it was between 50,000 and 500,000 doses of this experimental vaccine were injected in the Congo, and this is where a lot of the AIDS cases started. It wasn't AIDS, because we can see that. It was an autoimmune response where the bot people just started to die. But I'm not going to talk about that. Okay, just know that that's one of the factors. So what Bergman is alluding to here is the oral polio vaccine AIDS hypothesis, but he gets a lot of the details wrong. It's long been known that HIV is genetically quite closely related to simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV. It's pretty well accepted that the origin of HIV lies in the infection of humans with SIV. And the question has always lingered about how this happened. 
Now, the oral polio vaccine was created using cell culture of various primate cells. In a documentary called *The River*, it was alleged that chimpanzee cell culture was used to create a batch of polio vaccine used in Central Africa, and that since chimpanzees carry SIV, the vaccine could be the source of the AIDS pandemic. Subsequent testing of remaining stocks of the vaccine proved that it was in fact monkey and not chimpanzee cells used, and this pretty much closes the book on that hypothesis. And when Bergman says that infected monkey tissue was used, he's confused the central accusation of the theory because whether it was monkey or chimpanzee cells has always been one of the most contentious points. Furthermore, three different labs also tested the cells for retrovirus contamination and found nothing. And the genetic diversity of the oldest HIV sequences from the 60s pushes back the genesis of HIV by several decades. And besides, this theory on the origin of AIDS confirms the viral cause of the disease, so it conflicts with the rest of what he's saying. My guess is that he couldn't resist adding in lurid false details because monkey cell culture and vaccines sound scary to his uninformed audience. And you can tell he's hyping something he has no idea about because he says that the vaccine was injected when the entire hypothesis is known as the oral polio vaccine hypothesis, and oral vaccines are taken orally. So that's it for this video. I've been trying to upload something for weeks. I'm going to stop here. I actually have most of a script written responding to his entire talk on HIV, and if that's something you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. I had no idea how much of a crank Bergman was going into this, and if you're watching his channel for any reason, you should be very skeptical of his content because the information in this HIV talk is almost entirely false, and it's dangerous. Thankfully, I think most of his audience probably don't have HIV and aren't at risk of contracting it. But if you were to act on his ideas as an HIV-positive person or someone living in an endemic area, you'd be taking enormous risks with your health. So if you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to my channel, and I'll try and upload some more. If you want to do something to get my videos seen, rate the video up, leave a comment, and even better, share it. Most of my views come from people sharing my videos in Facebook groups, on Twitter, and forums, or on Reddit, and I really appreciate that. At the end of the day, I'll keep making videos as long as people are watching them. I've been getting into Twitter recently and sharing stuff on my Facebook page, so go ahead and like and follow me on those platforms, and feel free to message me about videos you'd like to see. I made this Bergman video in response to a couple of requests, and I want to make videos that people are interested in watching.